Hey everybody, thanks for joining me here and thanks for checking out my podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel and click the notification bell for new episodes. You can also find Shine Without Shame on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. My friend, Aaron Crater, <laughs> I think of you as an artist extraordinaire. I was thinking of all of your talents and I was remembering illustrator, graphic designer, game designer, puppeteer, storyteller. <laughs> I'm sure that's not the entire list, but that <laughs> does that hit most of your talents? Yeah. You know, you learn what to call yourself as time goes on. And what I've learned this last year is I'm a visual storyteller because everything I do is in and around the magic of storytelling. And when it verges out of storytelling into like other elements, like pure decoration or pure, while I admire and love that stuff, I'm really about the story. And so uh, I'm not probably the most polished artist. I, I know there's so many more polished artists. I've had to pretend to be a polished artist, but really what I love is how people create story and how people build story through the visuals. Oh, that's just, and so that love spills out into a lot of different forms, right? Like all the forms you mentioned, uh, whether it's working with a puppet or an animation or a comic book or you know, an illustration or an animation. I mean, uh, I love it all. I just love all that storytelling stuff. So, Well, it shows because it really <laughs> is beautiful work that you do. And I was also thinking back to when I first met you and your wife, Lisa, it was many years ago. I think it was like 17 years ago now, Aaron. Yeah, yeah. And I can remember the day that it was this event and you both were so like warm and welcoming to me. I was new in town, but it was, it was a sweet beginning. And then I remembered fast forward a few years from there, you, you went to the zoo or you went somewhere and you, as I'm sure you did often and probably still do, you just did some sketching and you sketched, mm. I'm sure many things, but the thing that you actually gifted me was a gorilla. <laughs> which I still have. I have not sold on eBay. I know it would blow up. <laughs> I love that gorilla there. I love that. I'm pretty sure that was on a gray piece of paper with yes. different colors, pushing the lights and darks back and forth. And that silverback, the, the, the dominant male just would sit with this sort of, uh, and boy, he posed so nicely. And I just, I remember it kept sending to my heart, don't move, please don't move. And he didn't, you know, <laughs> he sat still for that whole sketch. But uh, yeah, that, that was a fun trip. That was a fun. You know what I remember about you, Tiffany? Tell me. First time I met you, uh, you just walked on the scene like, I'm going to be your friend. I'm your friend. And I was like, I've never met someone so comfortable with themselves and with others and like being just a radiant light of friendliness. And those are the kind of people I typically make friends with. And I was like, yes, we're going to be friends. And so it was pretty instantaneous. Like um, there's a fearlessness there and a trust that is rarefied. And I just, I think that's really special. So yeah, that meant, that, that meant a lot and stuck with me. And sure enough, throughout the years, I mean, it just, yeah, for me, that never faded, that stayed. You know? It's the same, same for me. Mm. I have treasured your friendship and being friends with your mm -hmm. wife. And it's, it's been a really lovely journey that I wouldn't trade for anything. Oh, that's yes. a, it's like collecting jewels in this world. When you meet mm. these friends like this and you learn something from them and you just gain and everyone is different. And it's like, this is magical. This is the most magical thing about this place. It's just, uh, well, I think we should just talk about art, about, the work you do, but also your relationship to art. We, I know we've had a, a couple of conversations about this in particular, but I really am curious about your relationship with art and how it feeds you, but also when you create art, what you hope it offers people. I will tell you that I, I didn't have, I've never studied art formally uh, in any way, shape or form. 
I, I really, I mean, I love the arts. I love performing arts and I've been involved, but I haven't ever done a real like formal education. So when I've gone to, especially museums and I've gone with friends who are artists and even I, I attended an exhibit of a friend who is a fine artist, a painter, among other things. And I remember thinking, oh, well, there was, it, this was not my friend's piece, but I was looking at in the museum at this piece on the wall. It was like a white canvas with like a yellow sphere, like mm. a sun, you could say. But it, this was like a modern art um, yeah. museum. Yeah, I got that. Yeah, yeah. And so I remember saying, not in a cheeky way or in a disrespectful way or in a dismissive way, but I remember telling the people I was with, but I could paint that. It's just a, it's just a painting with a yellow sun or a yellow sphere. And the friend whose exhibit we were there to look at, again, this was not their piece, but they were there with me and they said, but you didn't paint it. And that's the difference. And they were talking to you about their education. They went to art school. Mm. And there is, I guess, it's a whole world about what art is. And there's a whole world of art and art education and art appreciation and art like analyzation. And it sounds like to me, people who studied art that they, they really believe that you're an artist. If you decide to go and put a yellow sphere on the canvas or a black splat or whatever. And the fact that you think someone else thinks they could do that, that's, that's cool. But like, you didn't do it. So therefore you're not the artist, at least not in that <laughs> specific regard. Yeah. And I always thought that was interesting. I, and it kind of at the same time made me feel like, I, like this is too complicated for me. <laughs> uh, what about, I just want to like, look at a Monet, you know, and I just, what about just the beauty? What about just a beautiful flower? Not that I'm saying I don't appreciate modern art or abstraction or all kinds of different kinds of art forms, but the intellectualization just seemed to be, uh, so I was taken a little bit aback by this, the comment of, well, when I said, but I could have painted that yellow sphere and my friend said, but you didn't. And they were not trying to mock me, but they said, that's how artists and the art world operates, right? And the fact that you didn't have the audacity or even it didn't cross your mind to create a yellow sphere on a white canvas means that, I mean, in that moment, you're, you're not the artist. You, know, you, you really have no claim or, or no opinion that matters so much in, in that piece of work or kind of that's, that's the way I interpreted it is that, but you know, you can, you can say, well, I could have done that, but you didn't, the artist did it. They were the ones who had the courage and had the, um, the motivation to do that. So I was a little taken aback because I just thought, oh, but I, this is too complicated for me. <laughs> this is many, this is many, many years ago because I thought, okay, I just, I like art. I like all kinds of art. It doesn't have to be just a flower, a beautiful, uh, you know, lily on the pond. But when it doesn't move me in a way that really gets me to think about life, even if it's dark or even if it's moody or even if it's abstract, but if it doesn't really make me viscerally have a response that is exciting or that's like interesting, um, then I think, but okay, but why? Like, what was the purpose of this? Was it to trip me up and other people up? Or so it's just been interesting me for me to think about art. And I, again, it, since I don't have an education or background, I don't really, um, I don't really think too much about it. I just like what I like, and I, I'm just wondering when you think of creating what, what is like part of your process or what kind of, what goes into, and I know I'm sure it depends on the project and the purpose, but are you thinking about in your art kind of making things complicated or making people like stumping people, or are you trying to, not that I'm saying 
not that I'm suggesting that you all, uh, or I'm, you can, you can answer the question, but that you're necessarily always trying to make people happy or feel great, but what, what is your process or how do you, how do you approach art based on like the experience I just shared? Well, one funny thing about art in a museum is you never see the, you never see the milieu or the, the, the world that it came out of the backdrop behind it. All you see is the one piece there. So what that person was going through, the artists they were surrounded by, the concepts that were, were being entertained, you know, all that stuff forms the backdrop that it emerged out of. And um, in some senses, you know, those descriptions, which sometimes get longer and more involved than the art itself, <laughs> um, you know, tend to try to give you that understanding so that you can appreciate, you know, where this piece emerged from. Um, so yeah, there's something to be said for art that's kind of universal and timeless. Uh, but then there's art that like kachunked in its in its backdrop, right? Like, you know, in the backdrop of when like say Van Gogh worked, all his work just kachunked. Like no one was like, "What are you doing, man?" You know, like that's not art, you know. And how amazing it is that against our backdrop now, we're like, "Wow, they were lunatics. They didn't appreciate this work," <laughs> you know. Um, so. How, you know, I don't think any artist can be separated from the backdrop they're, they're, they're in. Um, but when you move that art into a new backdrop, it may fade over time or it may be consistent, but you're still responding with love. I mean, I know like for a lot of people, art is something that it, it works for them because they speak the language of, of intellect. So they need that concept to be profound. They need to stump someone or to push an envelope. And that's, I, I, I went to an art school where that was like, you know, um, part, part of that New York school was, was what Carnegie Mellon at the time was really into. And they were really into concept art or the, the idea of uh, stumping people or coming up with a new concept or something, pushing the boundaries of what art is. Um, a simple response to the simple beauties of this world was not enough. Like it was like man had to add their own intellect because anything derived from nature has already been done and it's too basic, um, which is kind of, a, I found to be just a profoundly arrogant viewpoint because when I went into nature, I could get really humbled or I could see an expression in a kid or a little moment between a kid and a bug on the ground that was like, oh my God, that's art right happening right in front of me and just like quickly doodle it because I wanted to capture the story of that magic right there. And so uh, and for others, art is like, you know, geometric and it's like, uh, or it's like making a building look beautiful or, you know, or a piece of furniture. Like there's so many worlds of art um, from, from so many languages, you know, or, or art that gives you a spiritual experience, uh, gives you an emotional experience, right? So uh, you have these different languages that the world's versed in, intellectual and concept, emotional, uh, spiritual experiences, or one that's just sort of visceral, you know, like a, 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 you know, or like just gorgeous, like that, just a epitome of beauty or great design, you know, and you're like, oh, you know, so these are different languages. And um, I think they're all valid. For me, what I found in myself was a couple of things. I liked art that gave me an emotional response. And I liked art that made me ask questions about what's happening here? What's this story? And like, how did they think to capture that little moment? And I know exactly what's going on in those eyes on this person looking at this way. And um, there's a language that started to form and you could really develop a whole narrative or, or allow people the ability to make art with you by drawing something that they would, they would look at and then they made a story out of. And all of a sudden you're collaborating and people are having an experience there. Uh, so that was profound to me. But I remember going through a museum once and looking at the modern art show and I just stood in front of a Miro and I, I just love Miro. And I just started kind of crying and I just thought, Oh my God, what did you do to me? Miro? <laughs> like, how did you take these little shapes? Right? Cause I've seen other people just take simple shapes and they can't do that. But the relationship between the shapes he created, created this profound kind of like emotional response in me. And I'm not like prone to do that with most paintings or painters, but it was like uh, Miro found a way to break down something into its most fundamental pieces 
that could create an emotional response with color and shape. Um, yeah, that, that just blew my mind. And Mark Toby, I think, does that. You know, there's other artists that can do that. I've had, like, this wish that I could do that, but I'm not there. And maybe that someday I will do that with, like, you know, abstract art. I've tried to play with abstract art that way. But I think I have to understand more about the phenomenal world because most really good abstract artists actually are incredible drafts, drafts persons, draftsmen, draftswomen, uh, drafts persons. Uh, they, they're they're really good at drawing the phenomenal world, um, and then they start to see the thing behind the thing. And when you get to that, I'm just like, oh my god, Moreau's just drawing pure spirit right now, and I'm my spirit is seeing it. I'm not seeing it. Something's bypassing me and everything. Mm. And that when you're in that place, you're in awe, and then you just perforce like when you're in great nature. You know, and you're just like, oh, look at this vista. And you just start kind of weeping, you know. And for me, that's my favorite kind of art. But there's just so many great forms of art, you know. Not to mention theater and animation and the merging of music with acting with, I mean, they're all kind of coming from this beautiful world of our humans need to make something out of nothing. And there's something, touch, touch of the divine that's happening there. You know, we want to be the mirror of our creator. We want to, we are the mirror, an, a mirror image or a, a, a facsimile, I should say, of our creator. We're built in that image. So if the creator creates, then we want to create something because we want to feel that same, you know, connection. And no matter what kind of creation that is, everybody cr has the pride of creating something. Everybody on this planet has made something and they feel that, ah, oh, I made that, you know? And that's neat. You know, that's a neat thing to do. Some of us just um, get a little more addicted and a little more <laughs> like an addict about it. And others can, I can dabble with that and move on to some other virtues. But uh, I just love that virtue of creation. It's just, yeah. Hmm. It sounds like also what you're saying is there's a sacred relationship to art as oh, yeah. a recipient, as somebody who's experiencing art, but also somebody who's creating it yeah something's happening there and even if you looked at my stuff and go what's so sacred about that i don't know <laughs> but when i was doing it it felt sacred so you know it uh, just even feels like a meditation i do these little crosshatch drawings that feel kind of like you know kind of 16th century rembrandt feel i did go to a rembrandt show and i started doing these afterwards i had done them before but i started doing a lot more melissa's like you, you got so inspired by Rembrandt. And I was like, I never thought of it that way. But yeah, I love the way, you know, most people could look at that and say, oh, this is just all darkness. Like, but no, the, he's called the master of light because he, he uses so much darkness and just a little bit of light. And so putting a candle in a dark room and how you treat that as a piece of art, that has drama, that has story. And it speaks to something that we all feel here because we feel like we're in this world of primarily darkness. And we see that little candle and what it lights and what shadows it casts, there's something very, I feel like, metaphorically connected to the world we live in right now. And so I, I just deeply gravitate to that. And I've been doing a lot of those kind of little, little moments, you know, little light in a dark space kind of moments. Light in a dark space. That's so interesting to me. And because I think people as you know, the podcast for me is, is looking at the idea of shame as not really a useful, um, a useful space or a useful um, place to be in life for individuals. Like the idea of believing you're a bad person, right? I mean, we all do things that aren't, we all do things that aren't great. You know, our behaviors, our actions, uh, are not perfect and we misstep, but this idea that, you know, we're bad because of that, or we're a bad person because of that, I, I really would like to eliminate that as much as possible from the culture. And I've said many times on the podcast that I do think shame has a place in our society, especially when it's connected to like serious crime, right? Egregious behavior. But for the most part, I don't think it's that useful because people can get caught up and just kind of live in shame. And so when you're talking about mm. light in dark, in 
you know, reflecting or, or focusing in on light, but also using darkness to make light pop. That's kind of my way of, of interpreting what you just said. I, I'm curious if there's any connection to you in, in thinking about or reflecting on people and how Mm. art, whether it's the art you make or how just the idea of art or light and darkness, um, as a, as phenomenons in the, in the world, um, are likened to people's light and darkness as humans. Mm. And that I, I, I think that we we all have light within us. Some of us have more darkness consuming it maybe because of our behavior, but ultimately we are, we are light. We are, uh, and I know we don't necessarily all see that literally in each other, but at least, um, metaphorically, I know it's true that we are, you know, we're, we're carriers of light, but I'm curious how you connect that to art when you think of people, um, in the world and dealing with their, their darkness. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, I think I come from a point of view of really honoring and respecting that darkness is a creation for this world so that we understand contrast. Cause you can imagine if you're born in a sea of light and someone's talking about light, you're like, <laughs> so here we are. And there's so much, you know, things like shame, right? And uh, sure, they have a place. Darkness has a place. But when you find yourself retreating into shame or retreating into darkness, then you, you say to yourself, okay, well, this isn't, this isn't benefiting me anymore, right? Like, mm. and, I, and I do think like um, shame is a way to guide us. Like, ooh, yeah, I don't want to be part of that. Let me, let me let it use... Let, let me l- use that fuel to push me into the light. But the second it becomes something to separate us or divide us, you know, like, like a little jolt of like, I mean, a little of that goes a long way, right? Like, so mm. a little, woo, a little zing of, I feel bad. I want to move this way. When it becomes so much, then someone could get kind of acclimated to it. And then they, they kind of live in it. They internalize it, God forbid. Mm. And now it's dividing. So you say, I don't, think I can show up because I, I'm ashamed to show up. Mm. And so the devil probably loves this concept or, you know, whatever the devil is, like just, you know, the idea of, of, of personification of negative force. The personification of negative force probably loves shame because it's a great way to keep us divided. But to the degree that it like, you know, jolts us out of the dark and says, okay, well, I'm going to bring my best with, with, with people today. And try this. Um, I think that's like, maybe just the, the modest amount that it should be used, but it's probably so excessive, right? And when you talk about art, I mean, you can't really carry a lot of that fear and shame because it won't fuel you for very long. Hmm. It won't fill your art, you mean? Fuel your art. It will run out real quick. Like hmm. if you're, say, oh, well, I feel so ashamed about the things I, I, I'm gravitating towards or moving towards or want to make. Uh, because this person had this view and this one had this view. And you start to kind of use other people's, you kind of externally reference the viewpoint of where you're, you're attracted. Um, but really, you're better off playing through the shadows. Just get through it internally. If you're attracted mm-hmm. to something shadowy, get through it. You know, do it all and be done with it or be, be through it at least or be, find out what is in it that is, is you're seeking. Because you're seeking something to resolve, healing something, figuring something out. And who knows what good could come of that? Uh, that's my opinion. But when, if you constantly think of others and whether they're going to be a sh- putting shame on you for making a certain kind of art or force, I don't know, man. It just feels like it. you run out of gas real quick. And um, so, yeah, those are some thoughts. I mean, I do get a real charge out of doing something that um, has meaningful positivity for somebody. Like that, mm-hmm. I do get a real, like, for me, that's like the kind of, uh, that's like the vegetables on the meal. You know, that's the vegetables on the plate. Maybe that's not like the, <laughs> the most attractive that you didn't, you didn't go, you know, necessarily to get the green beans. You, you went to get the steak, but like the green beans are going to keep you fortified. And that, that's really, for me, artistically, the stuff that does good in the world, that stuff's going to really fortify me and, and 
yeah, I may have dessert and some other things, and that's that's wonderful. That makes that makes the meal great too. But like, I do feel like um, meaningfulness has that potentiality to to fortify us in ways that then make the other food taste great, you know, too. So <laughs> we just got to have a balanced diet on that. So. But, I get what you're saying. Yeah, it's kind of a. I don't know if that's what you were asking. What do you think? What do you think? I mean, you make a lot of beautiful art and. How, what does that mean for you, the, this idea of shame? That's nice that you said I make a lot of beautiful art. What, what are you thinking of in particular? Well, in I, particular, I, I think the art of who you are, as the, the art of the way you live your life, the way you conversate, mm -hmm. the way uh, specifically when you were here and you would uh, build the scripts you would build, the, the stories you would build, the way you would... Uh, you know, in, in the team that you were in, uh, and the participation, of course, as team art, then it's your ability to work as a team. And so that you're like, I mean, on you're, I'm like looking up and learning from you the way you work with people. Mm. Um, and really, I think the future of art is team art. Like we've had this romanticized historical view of the single painter in a room, tortured life, you know, makes art right. till he drinks himself to death in his 30s. But uh, it's not sustainable. It's not really matching the trends that I see the world moving towards. And, you know, you see stuff like Pixar where, oh, my God, they're masters of how humans work together. Mm -hmm. And they're making really beautiful stuff. These aren't kids' stories. These are stories for everybody. This is for the, these are like poignant moments. And they're talking about things like the soul and the next world. And they're really doing some interesting things on the internal dynamics of emotions and thoughts and um, and there's specificity in those, and and there's a host of artists that all have to work in harmony. I see you able to do that kind of work, like, and I've seen you do that kind of work in the in the various filmmaking projects. But your uh, capacity to work with others, so that's, I mean, I don't know if Thanks. if that you helps. see that same thing that I see, but yeah, I do. I I thank you for. I wasn't just looking for compliments. I wanted to make sure I understood what you were talking about when you when you referred to me as an artist because I don't I still don't refer to myself as an artist. I'm like I don't know if that's a title for me if it ever will be, but uh because I think because my art as you've so lovely articulated, I, it has a lot to do with people and engaging with people. I I do I do connect to what you were saying previously about darkness and, and light and that we shouldn't be afraid, you know, even if uh, we make some bad decisions or we stumble and fumble through life and we hit some dark spots, we shouldn't like, we shouldn't be ashamed about them, but we should just keep moving and not kind of hang out there. That's what I was taking away what you were saying from what you were saying. And that does connect to me as somebody who does have an artistic way uh, if you will, in working with people and, and connecting with people. I, I love supporting people, encouraging people to look at their not so pretty aspects of life or their bad decisions or the things that they're hung up on. I love helping people look at that and maybe just acknowledge it or honor it as part of their process so that they can heal and then move forward. I think a lot of, you know, the decisions that we've all made, um, the poor choices we've made, the, the missteps really do keep us back when we don't just take account and address them and then move on. Now, some, some of those darker areas or darker experiences are really traumatic and they take, you know, they can take years to address and, and then to, to rise above. But either way, I, I just, I, I don't, I don't judge anybody for horrible mistakes. Now, some people have done some really horrible things and I prefer not to hang out with them. <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, some really, really egregious stuff. Okay. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not really looking to be in your, in your circle, but <laughs> As a general rule, I I don't I still don't judge anybody for making horrible decisions. Uh, but where I really care to be 
present or a part of or to to uh, to promote uh, is people's evolution. I really care about evolution. I care about That's, my own. I mean, obviously, yeah. I'm I've got to focus on my own evolution. But I've I've dealt with some really dark stuff. I've had to address some some yucky things that I've experienced or that I've uh, that I've done that I, or that I've said. And, and it's a blessing because I got in there. I got in that dark closet. I opened up that door and I went in and I was like, okay, I'm just going to start taking one thing out and another thing out and one thing out. And I faced my fears. Like that's the scariest thing I've ever had to do. I mean, it's been a process over time. It's not like just one moment in time, but I've, um, I've done that hard work. And it is scary, but man, when you can lighten your own load of all those burdens, whatever did shame shame you or whatever you took on as shame, when you can lighten that load up and let go and just acknowledge, yeah, that wasn't the yeah. best thing, then you can move forward and you really are free. And that's what I wish for everybody is something like that. It doesn't need to be like what I went through, but something that allows people to let go of the dark stuff that, that scares them. And again, there's a, you know, it's a spectrum. Some people yeah. have never had anything really, really horrible and awful and good. I'm glad, but some people have, and it's, it's worth it. And I want to, I want to honor people. And so I think in maybe what you're saying as looking at me as an artist, because I, I connect with people and I, I have, I come from a storytelling background. Um, I like to, I like to show people, real people doing real things in life, talking about stuff that's been hard for them and how they've overcome it. It's cool. And it's, and it creates it something. Me. It calls you. That's beautiful. And it creates something, Tiffany, everything you do, everything you are part of creates something. We, we have a concept of art, which a lot of artists are really trying to push the boundaries of that concept. So that's why you see things like you know, someone puts a recording of their dog snoring in a museum or something, you know, <laughs> just trying to push the boundaries mm. of all this stuff. Where is art seen? What could it be? What could it look like? Um, entertaining the idea that it's all transformation, right? Evolution and transformation, taking these materials and turning them into higher materials. Um, so what you're doing with people is creating something for them, Right. Because you've liberated yourself in a way, you know, it allows you to see them shame free. And I think when you can have that kind of forgiveness for yourself, you can then have it for others and you mm -hmm. can exhibit it. And then that becomes um, infectious. And so that infectious element that you, that you have, and you're so facile with people anyway, so you already have the medium down to, to replicate that very rapidly. Um, then other people can take it too and they can look up and learn from that and do that with others, which now, like you're, like you're doing and you're seeing, you can start to form a small community or, 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 or maybe a, start to form a larger community around you of people all doing that. Mm -hmm. Now that's fertile ground for even more transformation and creation. So um, it's art on a big scale. It's art on... and. Yeah, I've always saw you as bigger than than the projects you were working on. So you're just always uh, rising to wider and wider, larger circles of creation. And that is kind of the heart of a community building. And I think society is such a ripe and beautiful, you know, don't you love it when you go to like these cities that are decimated and you see artists just like taking all that and rebuilding? I have a friend mm -hmm. in, 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 uh, he does it in Pittsburgh and Columbus where he'll go out and there'll be these like old rusty pipes that are connected to some weird box with something else and other pipes on a side of an old building. And he'll take that and he'll turn it into a scene. He'll just imagine a scene. Like it looks like a, a tape, a kid's table and he'll turn all those objects into something. That's cool. And they're just, I love that idea of taking like the decay and making something beautiful from it. And right now, what an opportunity because all of society fundamentally, not to get be a downer, but there's just lots of opportunity to build from the decay because there's a lot of community breakdown. There's a lot of, you know, our, our sense of cohesion as community is being challenged so deeply and it's so broken down. Well, starting out with, hey, 
shame free, you know, no, no judgment. Let's just show up. Let's just be, <laughs> let's drag all our ghouls out of the closet and dance with them right here and have a party and say, who are we? And what do we want to be about? And maybe some of these ghouls will leave. And <laughs> what are we left with now? Yeah. You know, and I just think you, what you do and you, you doing that, that is art. That's like a heck of a, that's a heck of a community art piece. And hmm. so that's, that's fun to see. So, you know, yeah. I see that. I see that. Well, thanks, Aaron. Thanks for pulling that out of me <laughs> and letting me share <laughs> and explore it because I know you and I have had this conversation before about me being an artist and I, I still haven't identified with that label. Maybe I just don't even need to. I mean, I haven't contemplated it recently, so it's not like it's weighing, it's gnawing on me or weighing me down. But when it has come up, I'm always thinking, I don't know. I don't really see myself as an artist. I, I am very creative and I do things that are creative, you know, filmmaking and performing arts and yeah. singing, but I haven't ever stepped into that artist world. And maybe that was why I had such a strange feeling about that museum experience. Um, with the, when I viewed the white canvas with the yellow sphere, because as you said, that's maybe more of an intellectual approach to art. And I, I, I didn't really connect with it. And so I mean, I went through college and I didn't connect with it, Tiffany. So I had a real identity crisis here. I spent four years paying for higher education and I don't feel like I'm the, the label of an artist. And I'm like, oh, what do I do now? And, you know, there was like a dirty word for, for what I was, which was a commercial artist, they'd call me, or, you mm. know, because I would do commissions or I would do, you know, uh, but I, also that didn't 100% fulfill me, but I didn't want to do like, you know, the gallery scene. So the narrow confides of the definition, it, it has a, I think it has a lot of people kind of saying, that, that's not me, you know, mm. I'm, I guess I don't want to put that label on myself because I don't want all the things that go with that. That doesn't match me. So the, we don't have enough words, right, mm. to, to, to be packaged like that. Uh, so we don't have enough words to really. So so really this last year is when I've really said, well, I'm, I kind of can say, I can honestly say I love story. I'm like a story artist. And, you know, and even I took an improv class and I'll do it. I'll use the medium of the body and other huh. actors and people. That's just as valid for me as a drawing. Mm. It doesn't really matter. So wherever the story comes alive, and especially if it's in a group and interactive, mm -hmm. oh my God, I'm on cloud nine. That is can, so cool. Yeah, if we can get a group together and do story art, I'm like in heaven on earth. So good and for I you. Hear, improv. I wanna, yeah, improv. And I want to see how mm. it changes with you and you and you and you and more people with more perspectives, more diverse perspectives. That's just that's some golden moments have come out of that stuff. And you can't capture them. They're not they're uncapturable. They happened then. You can try to like, you know corral the phantom of them later in some other art form but really it's just for that moment and it's it's profoundly unique but it changes you it makes you different i understand what you're saying the little bit of improv i've done has that's has inspired me and that's been my experience and don't you think that there are a couple of factors that are critical one is trust and I think one is trust when it comes to improv, but also, I don't know what the word is, but just not self-judging in the you moment. Gotta, yeah. Letting I all that go. I don't know what that word is either because I'm not a guru of that thing. But, you know, because I've done also role-playing games for so long, which is like kind of the, uh, you know, the grungy cousin of improv. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's the same thing. You know, you... <laughs> You really can't be self-conscious in that process. You have to be aware and feeding off the energy of everyone else. And so you, you pop into a mode that allows you a heavenly experience because you get to, you're yourself, but you're not, you're not conscious of being yourself anymore. You know, I don't know how to explain it any other way. You're, you're just in a pure state of beingness. Yes. And I think with, you know, social media, with, with um, looking at mirrors of ourselves, with, with all, all, so many aspects of, of, of uh, digital culture and as wonderful and powerful as those tools are, I think the medicine from when you get that saturation brain of s thinking inside your head too much 
and the, the self critics come out and you start to feed the critics in your head and they get bigger and fatter and, and they're taken over and now they're in there mm-hmm. and they're just, they're running the show mm-hmm. and you're like, wait, what about me? You know? So you go to an improv class and all those guys got to go out the room. They got to go sit outside for a mm-hmm. while <laughs> and you just play and free and you can't see yourself. You just see others. And, and yet you have a sense of yourself because of how it creates a reaction in others and, Oh, it's magical. It's the magical cure, I think, for too much of this stuff. Yes. And I think self-conscious is the perfect word. We we have to be vulnerable so that you can be self-conscious. So that, sorry, you have to be vulnerable so that you're not self-conscious, but then there has to be trust. There has to be a safe space, right? It's like you can't have a you can't have vulnerability without the safe space. And, and you shame can't is have gone in those processes. They get rid of shame. They do exercises to get everybody out of like that weird critical shamey kind of thing. And just you kind of turn into a five year old again. You you know, like a three year old, a five year old, where you just you had none of that. You were just like, let's play, you know. And it was yes. just so pure and so honest. And your imagination and all these things just come out and dance, and it's just fun. Yes, dancing does that too, right? Like we know that. Me and Tiffany have danced many occasions. This yes. is a place where you can just shed all these internal critics and stuff. So, yeah. Oh, yes. I do recall a few renditions of the thriller, <laughs> Michael Jackson's thriller choreography that we we uh, we exhibited at a couple I of parties. I still want to do it on skates. That looked fun. Oh, that was skates. That's right. Lisa, yeah, your wife showed showed me that video. That is... That's a spectacular. You know, I wonder, hmm, this idea of improv as another vehicle for mm-hmm. enlightenment and for community building and for evolution and for, you know, storytelling as a, as a way of inspiring and helping people move forward. I, I love that. I, I, it's like, Okay, you, maybe not everyone in your community, if in your neighborhood, is going to want to do an improv. Uh, but I, I think it is another vehicle, another tool that is so useful. Oh yeah. Uh, like art, like you said, it's it's way creative ways mm-hmm. to bring to bring people together who are, like you said, sure showing up, just trying to be their best selves, trying to let go of whatever is, was holding them down or keeping them back or keeping them from feeling they can't be themselves. Yeah. It's beautiful and I think process. it's why role-playing games have, have absolutely rocketed right mm. now is because it's, it's kind of a, a more rigidly guided, not rigidly guided, but it's, it, yeah, it, it, it has more parameters, I'd say, and rules right. and parameters than true, just endless improv. Um, but it's the same kind of spirit of, well, uh, I can do this with people that are very young, very old, uh, people with very different backgrounds. Like, there's an entry point for everybody, and you don't need a lot of a capacity or talent. Like, to get involved in like, you know, a storyboarding team, you know, you'd have to have a certain amount of acumen, and and to experience that kind of uh, feeling with a story team, you know, like or or a lot of other like theater teams and stuff. You know, you've got to have a certain amount of of capacity but but improv is really with a good coach you know it can get everybody involved in some exercises and elements first day and you're already making magic and that's kind of cool that's you know right you know yes because everybody's played right we've all played so we can all do this this is it's easy yes that's my dream job is to be able to play to, to do real work to make a contribution, to accomplish, be productive, but to play while doing all of that work. So I would love to do an uh, uh, improv workshop with you, Tiffany. Oh my god, because you get to know people even mm. deeper. And I think I got a good sense for your improv spirit because I, I think most of the days we were at that office, we were improving, kind of riffing for for time. That's right. <laughs> there was a lot of improv going on around there, but. Um, when we worked together, yeah, that's that, right. That yes. When we worked in the same office, I should say we were not yeah. on the same team, but right. different departments, but yes, or different 
functions. But yes, yeah, we we did. That's right. We did a lot of, of riffing. And I, with improv, when I take, I haven't taken a class in years, but I know that I, I do have to kind of go through that beginning, like, okay, I got to get rid of all the self like judgment. I still have to go through that process. It's not like I walk in and I'm like, I have no vulnerable. I'm like, no problem with vulnerability. I still have to kind of work through it for like five minutes. And then once I get in it, I, I do, it's so much fun. It's so liberating. And yeah. that's where real, like, that's where you could do a lot of problem solving. You know, if I know that's possibly a tool to work through, um, maybe not like an actual like improv scene, but you know, people I think are trying to find creative ways to problem solve, to brainstorm, to come up with a process to creatively uh, and collectively figure out something together. And I think that that has got to be, I think that should just be a part of my life. I want it to be a part of my, every aspect of my life, not just work. <laughs> yeah. It's creative you know. calisthenics because mm. I, I would love to see like someone do a study on that is pose complex creative problems to someone before and after they've taken an improv class because your mind is so limber, your creativity is so limber, you're, you're thinking in multiple directions and dimensions at once and all the editors have been put to pasture. So even, you know, even if the idea is the stupidest idea ever, it's kind of like my morning brain, I call it. Like if when I first wake up, that's a good time for me to brainstorm because mm. the ideas may be just so weird. <laughs> but in that weirdness, in that pure abstract weirdness, there's usually something that's a, a kernel of genius that uh, if you push it or work it a little, something's in there. And I've come up with some of the best stuff because I think I'm half dreaming still. Mm -hmm. And that's just like, there's yes. some, there's something that's not online in the brain yet. <laughs> and once that thing wakes up, it's over. It's just, it's just about like polishing now, but and editing, but uh, right. pre editor, that's, that's some beautiful, you're right. It's like, it makes you flexible and limber for problem solving. I never yeah. thought of it that way. That's just genius though. Well, I think that as the turmoil in the world continues, I don't think it's mm -hmm. going to slow down or lessen anytime soon. Mm -hmm. I think that we all have to, reach for new ways or maybe we've been reaching already, but we're going to have to really start to bring others into the new ways of working through problems creatively. And it's just so much more fun because that means people are get to show up and be more of who they are as they're contributing to dealing with challenges and issues. So you're right. It really is an extension mm -hmm. of art. And I'm glad that's why I love speaking with you about this because you help me understand, and I'm sure the people who get to you know listen to this and watch this will understand art maybe in a different way after hearing you reflect on it because you have the educational background, but also you've just been in, you've been immersed in art and creating it and looking at others who create, you know, others work artists work and so you have your finger more on way more on the pulse than I know I do because it's just not something I'm really steeped in so I appreciate getting a little education on <laughs> kind of where 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 art and the art world is is at um, well your questions are amazing because it's causing me to pause and think because I think I operate so so often from just passion and interest and like, oh, I want to do that. I'm going to do that. You know, that's where I'm at. But like to stop and think about all these other elements of, oh, what's going on when you make art? Like, you know, um, how, what's the relationship between fear and art? Because uh, th there's a very interesting book called Fear and Art. And I think yes. shame could be put, be put in part of that. And when I first read that book, I just was realizing you could take the word art out and put community building in mm. there. And every single statement in there would be a hundred percent true. Um, or you could put the word improv in there or, you know, there's a lot of processes that are transformative, evolutionary, like uh, creative that you could substitute. And um, yeah. So fearlessness, you know, um, is one, is one um, thing that I I noticed doesn't 
stick around for what I for, for my process. It just it's not really in there. And when it shows up, oh wow! I mean, I mean fear, not fearlessness, but fear. But when fear shows up in that process, it kind of shuts everything down. And I just like, okay, I got to work through something uh, to get to get to the fearlessness place. What do you do? I mean, I know I'm sure there's a lot of different ways of approaching oh, it's a fear million in your things. art, but oh, it's like uh, my mind is doing that that thing of what if, like what if this, what if this, what if this, and so um, I either have to go take care of that before I can do any art. Like, I mean, I I've talked to Lisa about this. Lisa's very similar too. You can have things that kind of haunt you, and you got to get rid of your hauntings before you can make good stuff, and so. Sometimes a long time will go by before I can work on a project because I just have to clear out all the little worry pieces. And it doesn't look like art, but it's me preparing to get past the worry pieces. You know, it's like having a room full of sharp objects and you're like a dancer and you're like, okay, we're going to dance. It's like, no, you're not. You're going to clean that room out is what you're going to do. And so I'm just cleaning the room out so I can move. And so creating uh, space to, to move is, 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 what it's, is what I think that's about. Right. And are you saying that the hauntings have nothing to do with the project? They just maybe are what's going on in your own life or, or are they connected to the project sometimes? Sometimes sometimes they are pieces of the project itself. Like, oh, we got to resolve this because if this doesn't get resolved, we don't know where this is going, you know. Mm, Ooh, that's a worry and I don't want to think about that. So let's clear that before we move forward. And, and other times it's just life stuff. Like, mm-hmm. you, know, yeah. can, you know, fears can manifest in all sorts of big or little things and and of course if you're you know if i got a friend or somebody who's directly suffering or someone close to me or or if someone's trying to oppress or suffer on me i mean all of a sudden the fears kick in and hey that's that's got to get resolved so yeah i I never put this together until now but probably a lot of artists that make a lot are probably pretty good at being peacemakers or or trying to result be problem solvers Mm. because if you can't now you're carrying that while you're trying to dance. And it's like, I don't think so. You know, so you're always trying to like patch up stuff, fix stuff, get stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? I do. That made me think about the tortured artist that you referenced that, but also the the (laughs) art that manifests when someone is in that stage of life or in, in going through something, people who, maybe have looked at an artist's work over the course of years can say, Oh, especially if there's someone who's, who are now, who's now famous posthumously, you know, they, they, someone can say, Oh, I know what was going on. That person was dealing with this and this period and you can see it in their art. And um, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I, I think that that's acceptable. I don't, I mean, I, in other words, I don't think there needs to be any judgment, judgment on the level of, shaming someone. I mean, you can, you can judge in the sense of what you think maybe the qualities of, you know, that, that art, um, have manifested for you. You can kind of assess and more in that way, but in terms of judging, like, Oh, that person, gosh, they were going through some stuff and you can just see that in their art, it's just not as good. Or, you know, I, you, I've heard people make oh. those kind of comments and it's like, but that person has the right to still create even when they're struggling it's not like you have to just like you were saying in your example of cleaning up the cleaning up the room with the knives or the sharp objects so you can dance or dealing with something in your life so you can um, you can you know focus on your project that I, I see the value in that but at the same time I I think for those people who maybe didn't maybe they didn't have as many tools or maybe their capacity to clean up their life wasn't as as great as, as another artist. And so they just, they just kept making the art. <laughs> yeah. They just danced with the knives in the room. And what kind of interesting, amazing dance would, would that have created? Because some people, or they just don't have a room big enough or they, mm. you know, all the objects that are sharp are fixed. And now that's outside their control, but mm. by God, the, the spirit is amazing and it's going to dance anyway. And we all relate to that. So there's a beauty there, you know, there's a beauty to it because we can all see, wow, that's all in there. And I've been through stuff like that. I might not have been through what that person went through, Mm -hmm. but we all are equipped with empathy. And so even if I haven't experienced something, I want to experience someone's art and I want to see 
their world because that gives me more life. You know what I mean? I think it's why we like going to movies. I can't live every life on this planet, mm. but something about the human experience, we want to crave that. So, ooh, cool. I get to live this guy's story for two hours or whatever, or this person, mm -hmm. this woman's tale, you know, and I get to be, I'm a man, but I get to see what it's like to experience life as a woman or as a person of color, you know? And so I think we all crave to these stories that help us see or see through art, see more life. And it, we're getting more life out of these experiences. And therefore, we're getting more transformation, more growth. So some people say, oh, it's just escape. I don't think so. I think it's deeper than that. You know, it it definitely, I can feel it in myself when it feels like, oh, boy, I just feel like I'm hiding from something here. I, I, I got I to gotta get to something real. But, but we all have a sense of that. That's fine. Um, that's something fun to experience, too. But I think fundamentally you crave another experience when you've only had one in, in mm. or you've only had a you know a few different kinds of tracks that you've been down yeah that is interesting and maybe the last thought i have to explore with you aaron is and we've talked about this recently especially connected to a movie that we watched in our respective homes uh, which I don't, we don't need to go into the details of that movie necessarily, but I, I wonder, I, sometimes I wonder about the idea of art and representation mm. and how much weight, especially right now in this era, especially when we're talking about pictures, films, or TV, you know, the motion art, um, moving arts, uh, when there's so much pressure for creators to represent every exact detail that is in the world or in that world that they're maybe mm. uh, showing a community, uh, you know, an experience of a, a certain kind of type of person might have or has had in their lives. The, the audience or people can be very critical about they don't think that that art re truly represents maybe, you know, again, that culture or that, that, that kind of person's experience or that region of the country or world or wherever. People uh, have noticed that people are getting more and more intensely critical about what they don't like or where they think some an <laughs> artist fell short. Oh, sure. Oh, and I'm sure that's this. that's not a yeah. new phenomenon, but it just yeah. I think because it's amplified because of social media and you oh, know yeah. everybody has an opinion and everybody's publishes their opinions every day <laughs> online. Um, <laughs> it's just really interesting to me as an artist, like I I can't represent everybody's experience who maybe looks sort of like me or comes from a similar background. I, I, when I create something, especially as a filmmaker, I'm thinking I, I want to be authentic and I want to be truthful to life, but there are so many different ways of expressing a story. And sometimes the story is steeped more in, you know, like a fantasy than it is reality. I mean, sometimes people play around, artists play around with metaphor, metaphor yeah. and style, like stylistically, uh, how they tell a story, but I I think it's something I'm thinking about down the road as yeah. a film a you know um, a filmmaker who will hopefully create a few projects that get out into the world and are seen by people at some point and in some on some level. Like, but I I can't. Um, whatever you think when you see me, whatever you think you know about me when you see me, uh, I'm so much more. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and that goes for anybody in the world, right? Somebody is so much more than what they look like and maybe where they grew up. So I, I think that it's not a fear, but it's like something I'm mindful of because someone or some people may be very critical of future work that I create if I'm representing maybe uh, a woman who's African American, but also Latina, uh, who grew up in America, but you know, who grew up middle class and who grew up going through like private school. I mean, it's that is a very you know, you start to whittle down to like 
the specifics of a person's life if you're talking about a character building a character and it's like I can't represent my story can't represent everybody else's experience but I understand the value of having for example people of color be at the forefront of creating art and being acknowledged for what they're creating but it is something that I'm concerned about because I'm not concerned maybe in that I'm afraid to do the work, but I just wonder what those kind of conversations potentially well, right. will be like. So I'm just curious how you, yeah. in your own way, think about being authentic, but also trying to reflect reality so that in a way that more people, more and more people can relate to or identify yeah. with. Does that make well, sense what I'm asking? What I'm- I, it does. And the pressure on me is different than the pressure on you because society treats uh, white people tends to, okay, that's Aaron Crater's art. So that's, that's specifically that guy. But then the second a person of color or a black person shows up, okay, this is the black representation. What? It's, Tif- it's Tiffany Walters, you know, please. You know, uh, so there's the individual accountability element, which is I can only be accountable for my experiences. And so when I depict something, I mean, I love this Pixar thing that I heard. They were like, you know, ask, why don't you show more, you know, right after a filming and they had the creators there. And this was a while ago that why didn't this film show? And they named, you know, different groups of people. And very flatly, he said, because I don't have any knowledge of that. I'm not going to tell their story. Hmm. But you're right. We need those people to tell those stories. So you're right. But my accountability is this: is the observations, the stories, the elements that I've come with. And so on an individual level, we're all accountable for that. On a societal level, this is where I think society is getting it right. To come at individuals seems a little strange. To come at the societal structure that only picks, you know, these artists' tales, they're missing a lot. And we need, there's a fear there. What is the fear? Why are we scared to hear these other stories, the Tiffany Walter story? You know, that why are we scared to hear these individual stories? And it's because we have a lot of fear in this culture that if we hear these stories, we're going to hear something we don't like, or we're going to feel guilty or feel bad about. But actually, deep down, we all crave all the stories of everyone's experience. So even the things you listed, the unique, you know, being Latina, being Black, having gone to a private school. I mean, this unique combination, that and a million other things about who you are and the experience that you've traveled in this skin suit through this world, that's going to be a unique tale that, trust me, everybody wants to know about because we all crave more life. I want to know what that life's like. I want to know what that experience feels like. I want to have had a piece of that to synthesize some element of your story down to a kernel that you can share with others is giving them so much. It's so generous. And, but as a society, we definitely have a problem muzzling. We're trying, I think people are honestly, I see a lot of effort to try to, you know, uh, face that, but that's a societal issue as individuals. I I don't see how I can write the Tiffany Walter story. I got to turn to Tiffany and go, you got to, you're going to write your story, you know? So, um, so there's that. I mean, that's, yes. but it also, right. Like if my relationships become more profound and complex, then I will write into my story, those interactions. Right. Mm-hmm. But if it's all same, same, then that's not going to be the most dynamic story too. So that's one, that's one of individual accountability too, is to, you know, make sure that our stories and our, our lives and our art reflect uh, a rich tapestry of our reality. And if we don't like that, that's not rich, make it rich, you know, <laughs> make your reality a little more rich. And that's, and that, I think there's fear once again, is the barrier there. So art and fear, you know, mm. are just so enmeshed and entangled. And when you see the, the, the obstacle overcome, you see an explosion of art. And I think, I think that's the potential of what we're seeing in society right now is this beautiful potential for an explosion of cool stuff. I think so, Aaron. And also, what do you think about I guess it is a reflection of the artist's journey and their personal development, but what do you think about art that quality of art there's some quality of art that is 
really rich and powerful and maybe enlightens you as a audience or as a, as a viewer. Uh, but there's some art that maybe isn't, doesn't have the same, you know, impact, but yet it's still an artist trying to express themselves. How do you, how do you, how do you deal with various qualities of art? Is it just sometimes are you aware, like, this isn't my thing. This isn't, this isn't doing anything for me, or this is actually negatively affecting me and I'm just going to move on. Like, do you, do you have a process where you're really conscious of how you re- respond to different qualities? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm a passion for good craft in art. I love that, but it's funny. It's funny when I see art so bold and so honest that has no craft, I love it too. And mm. and I'll tell you an example of that. A perfect example of that is, is go sit on the shoulder of any five-year-old making art. There's no craft there. It's not good, but it's so honest. It's so from the soul. You don't care. But when that gets, when that's like, when that starts to get muddled where it's not from the soul, but it's also no longer craft, it does agitate me. I don't want to sound like a snob, but there's a sign mm. that is on a, I won't name the name of the business, but a famous business near me that I have to cover my eyes when I pass that because it's an iconic piece of art for, for, for this restaurant, this, this restaurant that's been there for so long and everybody loves that. Uh, I can't look at that thing, man. They would have been better off having a five-year-old draw it. It would have had soul and life and you'd had all the crayon bumps. It had been just beautiful, but they were trying to be sharp and like good, but it's like, the worst it's the worst and so mm. and and so um but yet it's an icon and it it affects people so that's just personal judgment right and so i don't i wouldn't have shame for that person uh i can't look at it because i feel like it, it will make me a worse artist to look at it but huh. but for how's, others how's so? it might be a step up i mean, i don't want it to infect me with its it's it's bad aesthetics, like bad colors, bad mm. like like I know this is this is something that probably musicians everybody experiences. Like oh, they just there's a certain level like you with audio, your ear, you just like I can't I can't hear certain things, you know, like distracting, you know, um, and maybe ninety five percent of the population doesn't know what I'm talking about, but I, I've gotten to a certain level in craft where I have to keep my eye pure because I don't want to infect it with like uh, a certain level of craft, but it sounds snobby. It really does, but it's not because maybe there's some kid that would look at that and go, Oh my gosh, I, I want to be, a, I want to be an artist so I can replace that art. No, I don't know. <laughs> like maybe there's some inspiration hidden in there and, and it's encouraging. Like I also like it when you don't see the most perfect art because it's encouraging. We can all have something on a billboard. Mm. Why does everything have to be so like (laughs) the best of the best? I like that. I like, you know, some guy beating a can and recording that for a, a, a a piece of music. Why not? If you put his soul into it, that's beautiful. So. Mm. That's great. Well, Aaron, I always ask my guests at the end, if they would recommend a TV show new or old, which oh, one yeah. would it be and why? Wow, a TV show. It can be new or old, but why do you, no. what, what is it and why do you want to recommend it? Uh, okay, well, let's go with one that I've just been looking at recently. It's called Earth to Ned. I just, I love Jim Henson Studios, first of all. Is it Ned to Earth or Earth to Ned? It's Earth I've never Ned. heard of it. It's a, it's, it's a, puppet talk show so it's like puppets but they're interviewing like on a talk show people um and i think just the way people interface with puppets brings out another side of them that i just love seeing and some of the dialogue and some of the the way they produce the show i think they're probably interviewing and then the way me and lisa figure it they're probably coming in later and adding like puppet commentary which is kind of cool like the little sidekick is always coming up with stuff really fast. And I'm like, no way was he coming up with that that <laughs> fast. They, they kind of riffed later and added that in. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, you know, maybe that's the, maybe they're that quick. But either way, there's a lot of good humor. There's some really fanciful concepting. Mm-hmm. And it's also this ability to look at 
earth from an alien's point of view. So you kind of become a kid again and everything's fresh. And it's like, wait, what is this? What are you doing? Why, why are you making your hands like this? You know? And so you just get to go through all these fun human <laughs> habits, right? From, from a novel point of view or from a new point of view. And uh, yeah, I just think like Jim would be really proud of everything that's happening there. It feels like the spirit of, of Jim Henson's Muppet show, you know, where uh, they get very meta, where they're looking mm -hmm. at their own process of making a show and, mm -hmm. and the Muppet show, like kind of thinking of that, like, uh, and so for me, it's magical all around. I, I would recommend it earth to Ned. You know, I'm and the, and the, in the people they interview are very interesting too. So you get that mm -hmm. level where you get this, you know, fresh view of all these interesting people. And they, they've got a good, so far they've had a good cast of guests. I haven't seen all the episodes, but they have a good cast of guests that are diverse from different backgrounds, different concepts. And every show they try to peel back one facet of humanity, like music or, you know, humor or, you know, help me understand this humor thing, you know? So it's, it's cute. Is it all puppets or are there humans no. and puppets? The humans interacting with the, the, the puppets brilliant. are these aliens that have, that have mm. come to destroy earth but and a spoiler alert they're holding back on destroying earth until they interview a few people and kind of get to know <laughs> and they kind of are falling in love with earth and holding back on destroying earth but i mean th so there's this humorous sort of like impending doom element too I, it's just great i'm gonna check it out i i don't think i've told you that i really love puppetry i don't think we've ever had that conversation since i was a kid i I'm, i've never performed with puppets but i uh, to this day, I'll watch any puppet show that I can find, and I'm I'm a fan. So I were you check there this out. at the office when we did when Lisa built that puppet, and we did that whole puppet sequence stuff up in uh, Wisconsin with the Kingdom Conference and all that. And I remember I was on the periphery of that process. I don't know if I saw the building of the puppet. Are you talking about Dot Miss Dottie? Or a different mm -hmm. puppet before. Oh, I don't Mr. know that. Mr. Habibi, Mr. Oh, Habibi. They that found the footage. Familiar. Oh. The media services found the footage and sent it to me like a, a year or two ago, and I was like, "Oh my god!" They're like, "Do you want this?" I was like, "I, I got to keep it on some drive somewhere. This is just crazy." So, were you the puppeteer? I'll, I or, we put it up on YouTube, like an unlisted YouTube. I'll send you a link, please. You, yeah, I was the puppeteer and the voice. And, uh, oh. yeah, and Lisa, but Lisa made the puppet. She crafted it. Um, I think oh. she helped with some of the manipulation because it was more than one person could manipulate it. So, oh, oh, I've got to see our that, please. First foray into the pre Dottie days. Yeah. Yes. For those listening and watching, Dottie is a puppet, but also a character in a book that Lisa and Aaron created The Good in Me from A to Z. That book is. A treasure and Miss Dottie is the heart of that uh, that story, and so I have a special place in my heart for Miss Dottie. I call her Miss Dottie, but she's just Dottie. I know. Same here. That's she's a real. I don't know what it is about when Lisa makes a puppet and I start playing with it. It becomes a real, a real character outside of myself that I start to kind mm. of interface with, like almost like oh, yes. Dottie. What would Dottie? think about that. You know, oh it yes this it's creepy i think this is what creeps people out about puppets but at the same time it's what's magical absolutely is that that some entity between yourself and this inanimate object has just come into the room and it's like channeling in some weird way so mm -hmm. yeah i think it's legit creepy but if you can get over your fear it's magical it's, it's fun i i had the ex exquisite privilege it was an exquisite experience of watching miss dotty at barnes and noble i believe it was and the kids meeting dotty the most precious thing i've ever experienced <laughs> yes it is a magical experience to to work with puppets and to let them come to live and life and tell stories oh well i will be checking out the show and thank you aaron so much for making thank time you. yeah this Always was a really for you, Tiffany. Always. 